Hello, we um, move into the afternoon of the King's Chambers Pick and Mix, and we're joined now by Paul Lakin. Paul was a solicitor in a former life, um, and he's going to talk to you today about prescriptive claims. Now, it always seems to me that the prescriptive claims are, are often bandied around. It's an area of real complexity, though. And it's often easier to assert a prescriptive claim than it is to prove it. So it should be really useful to, have, to hear what Paul has to say about it. If you have any questions, uh, then feel free to use the Q&A uh, or the chat boxes at the bottom and we'll pick up on them at the end. Thanks very much and over to you, Paul. Thank you, Garan. Yes, um, as I say, today I'm going to talk about uh, prescription and in particular prescriptive rights of way. Um, I do an awful lot of easement cases and 99.9% .9 of them will have an element of uh, prescription involved in them either as a way of claiming a right of itself or as a means of expanding a, a, a right by means of an express grant. For example, if you have a, a right of way by express grant, but because of the width of the way, people have always used other land to turn round, then generally you will argue, firstly, that the turning falls within the construction of the right of way, and then secondly, in the alternative, uh, that you've got a prescriptive right of way to do it. So they're exceedingly useful as a means of, as I say, acquiring rights or expanding existing rights. But one of the reasons why I wanted to do this particular topic is there's an awful lot of confusion about what a prescriptive right is. There tends to be a lot of confusion with adverse possession because there's sort of time limits involved and there's certain overlaps between some of the concepts. And it's also certainly when defending a right and acting for lay clients who are facing a prescriptive right, the simple bewilderment on their faces when you explain to them that if somebody does something for a relatively long time, they not only do they become entitled to it, they get, an, they get a right to do so. Um, that I've seen an awful lot of legal costs wasted simply because clients can't get their head around the concepts. And that in part is because solicitors also have some difficulty in conveying that to their clients. So hopefully the purpose of today is to uh, go through what is a, has been described as a, a fairly complex area. It's also an area of some notoriety. And I know the Law Commission for ages has talked about getting rid of prescription altogether or having it more limited in line with adverse possession following the Land Registration Act 2002 with the notion that registered land is supposed to be the record of all title so you shouldn't really be able to acquire these things uh, uh, that lay behind the registered title. Um, to do that I'm going to go slightly around the houses as well to explain how some of these came around and look at it from a slightly historical perspective as well as what as the test, simply because I want to demonstrate that this is an area where, by and large, as long as you're falling within the mechanism that's set out from a defence point of view, there isn't a defence as such to these claims. What, there are, what you are doing is putting the claimant to proof that they uh, can make out their claim and fit the relevant uh, parts. And I'll go through that and we'll look at precisely what it is that has to be established. And what, then I'll end up at having, and I apologise, it's going to be like, you'll see there's a reason why mine is down for the, for the longest talk of the day, and it's because there's quite a lot to get through. Um, and then I'll end up with looking at the practicalities, and I do want to just sort of touch on some of the topics that have already been discussed. I, I want to have a quick look at experts, because often I come to a case either when it's just about to be pleaded or to put in a defence, and there's often an expert that's already been instructed, usually a surveyor of some kind, uh, on what their role should be and whether there's any real need for them at all in a prescriptive right-of-way case. And then also mediation as to where the parties uh, should deal and how the parties should deal with that aspect. So that's the, the sort of overall plan. Right, so let's start at the beginning. Um, obviously, you can't acquire a prescriptive easement unless it is an easement. So we'll start at the absolute beginning. An easement, as was set out and reconfirmed 
well, as set out in Rielmba Park as amended and then reconfirmed in the recent case of Regency Villas and Diamond Resorts uh, by the Supreme Court are the usual statements of an easement. So there's got to be a dominant and servient. In other words, there's got to be an owner of the land over which the easement runs, and there's got to be someone who has the benefit of the right. That's all that dominance and servient mean. It must accommodate the dominant tenement. In other words, the person of the right, it must be for the benefit of their land. That's as simple. The dominant and servient owners have got to be different. There has to be a separation of title. You can't have an easement um, over land in common ownership, although, of course, you can have quasi-easements, but that's a, an entirely different topic altogether. And then, finally, it's got to be subject, has got to be capable of being the subject matter of an easement, or lying grant, as it used to be called, but that really means it can got to be plotted. There's got to be of the kind and nature that uh, the law recognises of an easement, although, strictly speaking, that's not helpful because there isn't a closed category of easements, but Broadly speaking, that's what they need to be. And as I'm talking about rights of way, again, it's important just to clarify the definition of what a right of way is. And of course, the right of way, it's, as most of us will know, is a right to pass to and from one bit of land to another. It's different in that it's not a right to wander. It's a right to pass to and fro. So if it starts getting into the realms of it's a right to wander around a garden, then you start getting into difficult territory. And normally what is said is there has to be a fixed point. It has to start from point A, which is usually on the dominant land, and get to point B, which is a point on the public highway. And it's a way of gaining access and egress to and from the dominant tenement. So that's easements, rights of way. That's what we're talking about. Now, how do you acquire a right of way by prescription? There is, in fact, three. And this is why it is a, a somewhat confusing area of law, because you have three overlapping, um, some in some ways different, in some ways the same methods of acquiring uh, a right of way by prescription. I'm going to deal with each of these in turn, starting with historically the oldest and working to the more modern, which the more modern in prescription is 1832. So we're not talking that modern and you can see why the, the Law Commission thinks it's an area that's rife for updating. Now, in terms of the common law, what you have to demonstrate still to this day is user, in other words, that you have used the right of way from time immemorial, okay? And time immemorial, handily, is fixed by statute of 1275 of uh, 1189, the accession, accession of uh, Richard I. So you've got to show that you have used the right of way from 1189. Now that, when the statute of 1275 was put in place, uh, a 60 odd year gap probably wasn't seen as insurmountable. But obviously, as time went by, that became more and more problematic and practically an impossible burden on people to demonstrate that user had gone back to 1189. So what the courts did uh, was fill in the gaps, basically, and, and started assuming that if you could demonstrate 20 years use or more, that they would assume that continuity of use back to 1189 and got, got round a lot of the evidential difficulties that were associated with common law and still are. However, the difficulty is that a claim in the common law can be defeated at any time if you can demonstrate that the law was in the same or the land so it was in the same occupation or that there's some other reason why the easement couldn't have existed at any time before 1189 that goes as a as a sort of diversion if you're claiming say a right to light to a property if a house didn't exist before 1189 then you couldn't claim a common law prescriptive light right to light likewise with uh land 
certainly 1189, much of land was in common ownership. So it's very rare that you'd be able to actually uh, not establish that it was in common ownership before. So to that reason, long before 1832, uh, the common law prescription was becoming difficult to establish. But that didn't deter the judiciary. The judiciary thought, ha-ha, we can come up with uh, a cunning ruse. And the cunning ruse they came up with in order to assist people was the doctrine of lost modern grant. And again, conceptually, people have difficulty with this. And, well, that's not surprising because everyone's conceptually had difficulty with this from the day it was created. What is required under the doctrine of uh, lost modern grant is that if you can prove that you have had the requisite user for 20 years or more, the law will presume that that was pursuant to an express grant. In other words, that the party sat down, drew up a deed and executed it, but that has been lost. It is a complete legal fiction. No one suggests, and again, this is the thing that lay clients can frequently have problems with. No one suggests that the grant actually exists. It's just based on the old equitable assumption that the law will assume things that have happened for a long time have a legal basis. So effectively what the court did because even under the common law, the assumption was that there had been a grant, just that the grant was dated 1189. So in the doctrine of lost modern grant, it just shifts that date to the end of the 20 year period. So the assumption is that the grant to which this user is uh, legitimized by is just at the end of that period. And the big advantage that gives to a claimant is all of that baggage that belongs to the common law of, stab of common ownership of land back to 1189 goes in an instant. You just simply don't have to worry about that because the grant is deemed to have been at the beginning of the user. So from a claimant's point of view, it is a blessing, um, which is why in reality, I can't envisage circumstances where a claim under the common law would succeed, where a claim to the lost modern grant would fail. There may be theoretically exist. Uh, I can't really, uh, as I say, I can't envisage those circumstances. People by and large rely on doctrine of lost modern grant so far as prescriptive rights. In terms of 20 years, it's any 20 years. That's the beauty of it. Um, and once you've established your 20 year period it can only that then you acquire your easement which can then only be lost in the ways that you can lose an easement by abandonment or whatever and they're really express surrender which isn't likely to have happened um an abandonment you know there are those cases that show 40 years non non-user and even upwards longer time periods do not amount to abandonment of an easement. So once you acquire it, it's there and it's, it uh, exists subject to some quite narrow uh, grounds. On the screen, I've got the, uh, what's regarded as the definitive statement, which is from the Tahiti Minerals and Norman case that sets out precisely what the judicial basis for the Doctrine of Lost Modern Grant is. And you'll see that it's such enjoyment having the necessary qualities to fulfill the requirements of prescription. So it just sort of builds on what those requirements were for the common law. It's really an extension, as I say, of the common law. So uh, again, it shares a lot of the qualities of it. Um, unless for some reason there is incapacity on the part of the person or persons who might at some point in time before the commencement of the 20 year period have made a grant. The existence of such a grant is impossible. The law will adopt a legal fiction that such a grant was made in spite of any direct evidence that no grant was made. So you can't defeat, what that means is you can't defeat a, a claim in lost modern grant by proving that no such grant was actually made. 
that doesn't work. That doesn't that doesn't shift the legal fiction, which again is perhaps surprising. What you can do, and the only way you can do it is, is if there was nobody competent at the time that the, the fiction was supposed to arise, if nobody competent was available to make the grant, then that will defeat it. But again, that's very narrow and in most cases isn't likely to happen. So again, it's not something that most of us on a day-to-day -day basis are really gonna need to worry about. Um, yes, the, the quote goes on, as you can see, uh, and deals with that point. Uh, if the legal fiction is not displaced by direct evidence that no grant was made, then it would be strange if it could be displaced by circumstantial evidence leading to the same conclusion. So you end up with a, as I say, it's a complete, complete fiction as to whether or not it was. So what you have to show is under the doctrine of lost modern grant is 20 years use, 20 years continuous use, whatever that is. And I'll come on to look at continuity in terms of rights of way. As of right. And as of right is again a legal term of art that has a specific meaning. So if you tick all those boxes, then you can, the court will declare that you have uh, acquired an easement under this doctrine. So that's that. Now, because it was uh, a complete legal fiction and because it was judicial, uh, judicially made law, there was a bit of a, you know, bit of a disquiet. MPs didn't like it. Some may say nothing has changed. Uh, and some, so the Prescription Act was enacted in part in an attempt to kill off the doctrine of lost modern grant. I should just say the first um, recorded case or reported case, should I say, of uh, the doctrine of lost modern grant is a case of Lewis and Price, which is a 1761 case. So it's, it appears that certainly it was being operated by judges probably a good hundred years or there or thereabouts before the Prescription Act came into force. So in an attempt to kill off and give it a proper statutory basis as to how it was, the Prescription Act 1832 was enacted. Now, various commentators, and I, I, I don't disagree necessarily with this, uh, described the Prescription Act as the worst piece of drafting on the statute book. And I have, section two is there before you in all its glory, and it is just a endless minefield of drivel, quite frankly. It's almost impenetrable to most people to understand what it means and uh, what on earth is going on. But if you can make your way through it, it sort of says, basically, you've got to have 20 years use, okay? There is a 40-year period, um, and if you make it to 40 years, then that becomes absolute and indefeasible. But I'm not going to worry about that, because simply if I diverted off into the 40 years as well, we'd be here till probably Christmas. So I won't, I'm not going to be looking at that. But that section two has to be read in conjunction with section four, because one of the standalone distinctive features of a claim under the Prescription Act is it brings in the notion of interruption, and that's in section four. An interruption is a specific thing in terms of prescription the right under the Prescription Act. It means physically a hostile interruption. And if that is acquiesced in for longer than a year, then that means that time, that just stops time from running. Um, so that's a particular feature of the act. And it also means that the time period, as it says in relation to section four, whereas in the Doctrine of Lost Modern Grant, the 20 year period is any 20 year period, at all, going back as far as you want to go, the 20 year period that has to be established under the act is immediately before any proceedings are started. Now those 
or it's brought into um, dispute. Now they can be, it's been held that um, proceedings before the land registry or an application to the land registry for a registration that is then objected to by the owner of the land is sufficient proceedings for the purpose of the act. So whether it's pursuant to sort of a land registration application or an application to the court, the 20 years has to be the 20 years immediately from proceeding the application that you've made. So you are fixed with that period and that period alone. That's one of the um, major problems with um, the Prescription Act, because you are stuck with that period. And normally, again, one of the reasons why one party or other issues an application or court proceedings for a declaration is that there has been a good deal of hostility or a dispute has arisen as to whether or not these rights exist. That may mean that in the period immediately before any claim is issued, they may peter out or become more sparse as the parties have geared up in, onto a war footing before the issue of proceedings. So again, from a claimant's point of view, that may make it more problematic, um, but not from a defendant's point of view. So again, that's one of the big limitations of the act. Now, if you distill all the gibberish that's set out in, the, in section two and four, what you're required to show under the act is 20 years use. You're required to show continuity of use. In other words, the use has to be constant throughout the 20 years. It has to be without interruption, as I say, and that's specifically hostile obstruction whereby the use is not, um, is blocked. And then that's acqui acquiesced in by uh, the person asserting the right. The use has to be as of right. And as I say, that's a very specific term of art that I'll look at in more depth in due course. There has to be enjoyment by the person claiming the right. There's a question, I put a question mark, there has to be knowledge of the servient owner. I put a question mark over that because one of the things, if you, there's a lot of cases, a lot of, um, most of them are village green cases, but they refer to um, as of right in the statute. And so the Supreme Court in half a dozen cases have looked at and given their view as to what the meaning and what the basis of prescription is. And there's no consistent theory as to what is the judicial or jurisprudential basis for prescription, whether it is properly acquiescence, in other words, by allowing just someone to do something on your land for long enough, that's the basis that gives rise to the right, or whether it's something else. I know Colin Sara in his book uh, argues quite strongly that the basis is, or the the basis for the way the law is framed at the moment is expediency rather than properly acquiescence. But I think for the purposes of today, it helps generally and helps clients to understand that the basis is really about acquiescence. So because it's about acquiescence, there does need to be an element of knowledge on the part of the servient owner. And again, I'll look at that in more detail as to to what that is required. Um, and where it does make a big difference, of course, is where the land is tenanted. Just as a general point I really should make is of course, easements are for the benefit and are for the benefit of the freehold land. They are a freehold right. So even generally where you have land that's tenanted, any use by the tenant will give rise uh, of a right for the benefit of the freeholder. So that causes a certain difficulty where the servient land, the, the land over which the people are, are crossing is tenanted. And again, I'll, I'll look briefly at, at what effect that has, but that's something that um, 
is worth bearing in mind if ever you have to advise and it becomes apparent. Certainly, it's most relevant in relation to agricultural land where land can be tenanted for very long periods of time and often the landlord is living nowhere near the tenanted farm. Um, and it can certainly cause an obstacle in those circumstances. And then finally, legality. The right has to be a right that you can legally do, put simply. Um, and I don't really need to say an awful lot more about that at, at this stage. Now, as of right, now one of the cases I was just talking about is the Barkerson on North Yorkshire County Council, sitting in North Yorkshire. It's what I like to refer to every now and then. Um, and you can see it relates to the Common, Commons Registration Act. And what Lord Newberger did is explain what he thought the phrase as of right meant. And then he concludes at the end, um, Lord Lindy's statement that the words as of right were intended to have the same meaning as the older expression, neck v, neck clam, neck precario. Um, uh, nowadays, we're told we're not supposed to use Latin, which is a godsend for those of us that went to uh, a, a normal school. Um, so what that means is without force, without secrecy and without permission. And that's been a phrase that's been used in relation to prescriptive rights. Again, I could say from time immemorial, and I, I don't really mean 1189, I just mean the wider sense in those terms. So it has to have those features. And again, each of those phrases, without force, without secrecy, and without permission, has its own meaning. So in when it is said that a, a, a right has been exercised as of right, it means that it has been exercised without force, without secrecy, and without permission. So if you are the claimant, you've got the job of proving three negatives. Although the reality is, of course, if you're acting for a claimant, you just say, I've used it. And it'll be for the defendants to raise whether or not within that period it's said it was any of these particular limbs are applicable to the quality of the, the use that was made at any particular time. So let's just go and have, a, have a, a look at what each of those limbs means. Without force, this is simply means, you know, where there is conflict about the right of way. So where a person seeking to uh, exercise the right protests at being stopped. So if you put a, someone's been using a right of way, or uh, the, the phrase, that, the example I always like to give is just walking across your back garden. If you object to them, object walking across your back garden after 15 years, um, if they protest and say, well, no, I've got a right, but don't continue to use it, then that's not an interruption. But if they refuse to accept that you brought it in, uh, there's a dispute about it, then that continued user will be by force. So the phrase carries, and it's not just a literal meaning of by force, you know, you don't have to stand there and you know, like a game of old fashioned game of British Bulldog, one side charge towards you as the other stops them and have this wrestling match in the middle of the right of way. It doesn't have to be by that. It can be shown um, that as long correspondence that puts it in protest is sufficient to make it by force. And again, as I said, that's one of the problems in terms of the act, because often the dispute has arisen and one side has said, get off my land, you've got no right. And that may have had the effect of stopping time, which could mean it difficult for a claimant to establish a 20 years immediately before a claim is issued, because usually, as I say, people don't issue claims when things are great and dandy between all the parties. What is also handy and what has also been held to be sufficient to put something or to make it uh, neck V is a sign. 
a sign that says private land, get off, keep out, go away. Um, that makes it clear that whatever user is not as of right, because there's a declaration that this is private land and that everyone should keep out. So that's NEC V. Um, without secrecy, without secrecy is a an extension, as I say, on, of, the, of the view that the basis for prescriptive rights is acquiescence. Again, just to go back to my example, if someone's crossing my garden, if they're doing it in the middle of the night, um, under cover of dark, without leaving any trace and doing it all very uh, secret squirrel, I have no idea that that's going on. If after they've been doing it for 20 odd years, it could be longer. Um, pop out and go, ha ha, we've got a right. We're claiming a right to do it. I'd say, well, that isn't open. That was secretive. How could I ever object? I could never claim that I had any basis on which to stop you because I didn't know it was going on. So it has to be open use. It has to be use. Of, a, of the right, of the type that would give the owner of the land the idea that somebody is using this land and may or may not claim the kind of right that ultimately they are going to claim. It doesn't matter um, if the person, the, the actual identity of the person isn't known just as long as it is known that somebody is using it. But again, as long as it's done openly, just, you know, whatever hours of the day that are required, then that's sufficient for it to be without secrecy. Without permission, and without permission is probably, is, is often trotted out as the main battleground and, and the, one of the basis, most common basis upon which you know, prescriptive rights are defended. Um, because clients will often say, oh, it was, um, it, it was done with permission. I let them do it. You know, I knew they were doing it and I uh, happily let them get on and do it. But you have to remember that the whole basis, again, this is why I say it's, it's most useful really to consider acquiescence as the proper basis for prescription to consider that that's the whole point of acquiescence if you know that they're doing it and you've just allowed them to do it then that gives right to the right to the right that's claimed that's the whole point of the the right that's claimed what the uh, various cases demonstrate is that basically permission is a positive act you need to, ideally, what you've got is a letter to someone or correspondence, which you can point to and say, look, you asked, is it all right if I use your track? And you said, yes, you can use it on a track. You can use the track on a Wednesday or on a Thursday or as often as you like. That's fine. I don't have an objection to it. Absent an express either in writing, best evidence, orally okay, as long as you've got the parties who are supposed to have had the conversation. Although again, one of the difficulties, and I'll talk about evidence at the end, one of the difficulties is often a lot of this is goes back in you know, the distance of time and the parties who may be fighting may not actually have the, uh, the relevant evidence that is required. But if you've got the parties who, or one of the people who had the discussion, then you know, the discussion about you've got, I'll let you use this right. Where it becomes slightly trickier, and there is a Tyler Hotels case, is where one party gives permission, but then the, the ownership of the land changes as whether or not there's a, the, the license was personal, so that once the land changes, it, it evaporates. 
and uh, whether or not then it has to be renewed by the new owner and there has to be a second specific permission to prevent time from running. Uh, and what the courts have said is, is yes, there does in those circumstances. The other argument and the other bit that's interesting is if you, you can often have use that starts off pursuant to a specific agreement, but again, it then drifts off over time and is there a point in time when you can say, actually, this use now then becomes as of right, as opposed to um, pursuant to the permission? Another part, a corollary of the permission, is if you have a already have an existing right, of course, then the court will assume that your use of the land is pursuant to the existing right that already that you already have, so that you unlikely to gain any extra rights on top of it unless as i say you run a kind of a construction and an alternative prescriptive right to increase the rights by prescription um, but again in, evidentially it can be difficult to to prove that the the use that you're saying is over and above wasn't um, pursuant to the existing right it can be in certain yeah and again, to some extent, for practical purposes, it's almost better to think of this as a theoretical possibility of implied permission. There needs to be some fairly clear circumstances where permission is granted, um, but you're simply Im implying that agreement from practically an agreement that isn't quite an agreement. As I say, because otherwise, the distinction between tolerance and permission is the key to acquiring a prescriptive right. So if you fall on the, on the tolerance side, as uh, despite what many a client will tell you, then um, I allowed them to do it. But yes, if you, unless you communicate it in some way and there's something you can hang your hat on to say that's the basis of the consent, then you've just simply tolerated it so that um, it will be without permission. Again, and, and one of the things to bear in mind, if, if you're advising a client, uh, signs are a marvellous thing in prescriptive rights of way, so that if you stick up a sign saying, whoever uses this right of way does so with my permission, which is often what you see, say, on permissive footpaths, is a good example, even though that's a slightly different basis, but it's a similar similar thing, um, then that has been found to be sufficient to make any use of the way from that point on permissive. But that is on the basis that the user accepts that it's permissive after, but that will be a matter of evidence in due course. So if we, tie together the cases, where do we get to? I'm just conscious of the time. Um, what the two authorities, if you sort of merge them together as a, as a practical distillation, get you is the following points that you need to consider, okay? So firstly, the use needs to be visible, okay? But as long as it's visible to the owner, they don't need to be aware of who precisely is doing it. Um, or the character or the extent of the use, provided that it is uh, some fee simple and not and neither forcible or secretive. So it just has to be aware that someone is using the land. And again, in a recent case, I had that because it was a farm track in the middle of nowhere. But our farm overlooked, it was a long way off, and, but you could see the land in the distance and that was probably gonna be sufficient for someone to, to have noticed that occasionally people would drive down it. Um, there is therefore a need for the owner to take reasonable steps. So if he becomes aware that somebody is using his land, then the onus is on them to take reasonable steps to go out and make inquiries as to who it is and, and to what extent they're using it. If the user is, if there is neck v, neck clam, neck cario in right of another fee simple adverse rights uh, will arise in due course, 
unless the Serbian donor takes steps to stop them. In other words, if it has the right quality of user, it will give right to a permissive, uh, to a prescriptive right. Um, the permission point, I think I've probably dealt with in sufficiently, doesn't add anything to what I've already said. And again, there's the interruption point at the end. So that's a useful potted to bear in mind when advising people. The simple point is if, if a, doesn't really matter which side you're on, if someone can make out the right type of use for 20 years, then they succeed. It's as simple as that. And that's again, something that clients can often find quite difficult. I've talked about continuous use quite frequently and continuity in terms of some easements is more readily definable than others. Clearly in terms of right of way, to go back to my crossing the garden analogy, if you take it literally, continuous use would mean that you had to walk backwards and forwards across my garden for 20 years. But of course, rights of way are infrequent. They are intermittent rights. No one uses a right of way 24 hours a day. They use them as and when is necessary. So um, what the courts have said, quite reasonably, I think in my view, is that um, you've got to take into account the kind of land and the nature of the right that is being claimed. There I set out um, what Lord Justice Linley in Hollins and Verney says that no actual user can be sufficient to satisfy the statute unless during the whole of the statute the, the user is enough at any rate to carry to the mind of a reasonable person who is in possession of the Serbian tenement the fact that a continuous right to the enjoyment is being asserted and ought to be resisted if such a right is not recognised and if resisted and if resisted to it is intended and then in White and Taylor, Mr Justice Buckley, as he was then, said the user must be shown to have been of such a character, degree and frequency as to indicate an assertion by the claimant of a continuous right and a right of the measure claimed. Sorry, and the right of the measure of the right claimed. So, again, for want of sounding a bit like a broken record, it's because... This all goes back to acquiescence. You've got to have an understanding of what's gone on. You've got to, as long as the right is sufficiently frequent to impinge on the mind of the person who owns the land so that they would be aware that there's a possibility of the right being claimed. This is meant in terms of uh, rights of way that some fairly infrequent use of literally two or three times a year, in relate, certainly in one case in relation to farm land, has been sufficient to give rise. As long as it was the same frequency throughout the period, there were no gaps in between on all those kind of things. So it is, to use the phrase that courts uh, are often, uh, and to which obviously in practice don't really help a great deal, I'm afraid, is it's a question of fact and degree in all cases. Again, often, in reality, that doesn't pose much of a problem, but when you get to more remoter agricultural kind of use, then it can do, because they can say, well, it, you know, when does infrequent use become not used for a sizable period? And that's, that's always the tension, and that's usually the matter of fact that the court's got to determine. Is it infrequent use that's consistent, or is it actually periods of non-use? such that time isn't running. And the court need, will have to, as a matter of fact, make a determination on those points. So, that brings me on to a wider point in terms of knowledge of the Serbian donor, which is what happens or to what extent 
does knowledge of the freehold owner matter where the land is tenanted? And the Williams and Sandy Lane, Lord Justice Chadwick, set out these propositions as a general sort of, again, you, you have to be careful, as is said in, in many judgments and by many judges, judge, judge pronouncements are not, not statutes and are not to be treated as the same, but they are indications of uh, what the law is in relation to any particular thing. So where the grant of the tenancy of the servient land, in other words, where, where the land over which the right's been claimed uh, predates the user, uh, or on behalf of the owner of the dominant land, the question is whether the freehold owner could take st steps to stop it. If the owner could prevent the owner, did he know about it? So in other words, what was the knowledge of the actual freehold owner at the time? And the fact that he was out of possession when the user began may be sufficient to prevent knowledge being imputed. So it may be the case that, that the freehold owner just says, I didn't know anything about it because all the time that this was claimed, it was tenanted. I live miles away. I know nothing about it. I don't know. And so if there's no absolutely no knowledge of the serving donor, then that's sufficient to defeat the claim. If the owner was in possession when it began, but subsequently granted a tenancy, the question again is whether he knew it or whether he should have known it. And if he did know when it began, could he have taken steps to deal with it. So in those positions, he's sort of in the position of a, of a normal owner. He knew it was, it was going on, he let the land, he probably could have done something in the interim. And if the owner was not in possession when the user began, the question is namely whether he could have known it and could have stopped it. Okay, so again, it's worth just bearing in mind that uh, the takeaway from this morning is it's not quite as straightforward where the land is tenanted as opposed to dealing with uh, matters straight away. If you succeed in getting to your, getting through all those hoops, what is the, the nature of the right that you acquire? Say, and this is something that is, it frequently gives rise to dispute. I've got one, in fact, ongoing at the moment about exactly the extent of the prescriptive right of way is is the central issue you know is does it fit combine harvesters or is it just for little cars is it as often in the, an express grant if you have an express grant then the, the width however wide the right is is only really limited by the physical features on the ground at the time or is it limited by the scope of the user and that was quite an academic debate that raged for some time it's pretty much been answered um, in favor of this is the loose and linen shellfish case which is actually about ancient fishing rights which is quite interesting um, and the general rule you can see what the, uh, the supreme court said was um where the right of way was acquired by user, the extent of the right must be measured by the extent of the user. So in other words, if you use it in a particular manner for 20 years, the right that you acquire will be to carry on the use pretty much in the same way and manner as the previous 20 years. Often, sometimes there's concern about clients about Trojan horses and whether or not the land at the end is gonna be developed and suddenly you're gonna have um, an entire housing estate driving up and down, that's unlikely simply because that's likely to be an excessive user. So unlike an express grant, which is likely to be construed as as wide as possible, subject to limitations, either in the grant or physically on the ground, uh, a prescriptive right is very different in that it is limited because it's an extension of the user and that's the nature of the right that's been acquired. Right, um, that brings me on. So, so that's, and again, I, I apologize, that's quite a lot of law to consider and to take in in, in a relatively short space of time. And that's quite a, a sizable chunk of any uh, land law book that we've had to trot through. 
things to consider, as I say, when you're acting for a party on one side of a prescriptive claim or another. The first is the evidence of 20 years use. By and large, these cases, although all that gubbins I've just been through will is in the background, a lot of the things that the court will, the issues that the court will have to determine are simply the factual issues as to what has gone on on this land. And that is the nature of the evidence that really both sides need to be considering in terms of leading. The difficulty, as I've already alluded to to some extent, is often the dispute arises when one person moves to an area, in my experience, frequently. So you often have one party who hasn't been there very long and one party who's been there for ages. And the friction has arised over the use of land as to whether or not um, it's allowable because the whole point of prescriptive rights is they're not on title. So someone's arrived thinking, oh, this is fine. And they discover that their neighbours using the what they thought was a quiet lane in front of their property to um, drive up and down. So the difficulty often can be is getting evidence of use over the entire 20 year period. 20 years is a chunk of time to go back. Not many people, certainly um, the way modern demographics are, people don't stay in one property for that length of time in the way that perhaps historically people did. They are far more mobile and tend to move on a far more far frequent basis. But you don't have to be, so the first port of call is, is clearly successors in title if you can find them and you know where they are, because they're going to give you at least a reasonable explanation as to what use has or hasn't gone on in the past. If you haven't got successors in title, then cast around, because there's usually someone, certainly if you're talking about villages or far more remoter areas, who've resided in the area for some considerable time, and we'll be able to give their view as to how this is used. I mean, the more, the closer they live to the land in question and the more connection they have with it, then the more cogent the evidence. But, you know, if you're left defending it, then you might just have to get evidence where you can. So, but primarily you need to sit down and concentrate on precisely what that use has been throughout the 20 year period and whether or not there has been any breaks in use that you can say, demonstrate that it's not continuous or whether there's any permissions. All those are matters of fact. So as I say, largely on a defended case like this that gets to trial, they are simply issues of fact for the trial judge to determine having heard all the evidence. So 20 years, nature of the use, permission. Um, now experts, Obviously, Mark gave his talk about experts and frequently in these kind of cases, I, I'm instructed either to draft particulars of claim or come in to advise before issue or when a defence is needed or when it may be required soon. I often find that the first person that they've instructed is a surveyor. Now, as I've hopefully demonstrated, a lot of what needs to be considered is the factual basis of use of the land over 20 years. In prescriptive claims, the use of expert evidence is, is really limited, save for one area, which is exceedingly useful. And that is the production of a decent plan, a proper large plan by which you can demonstrate the land over which you are claimant, if you are claimant, or the land that is in issue if you are defendant that you can either plead to as a claim or as a defence. And that is a, a proper use of a surveyor. Other than that, in prescriptive claims, I would really save you money. There, there's not much they can add. Often they tend to cloud the issue. Um, I think I've only known one case in over 20 years where they've actually got anything vaguely close to the right answer. So um, it's usually a waste of money. It can entrench views in the wrong direction, which doesn't make actually the, the case any easier to manage um, and should be limited, as I say, in my view, just simply to the production of a, a proper large scale plan 
that everyone can look at if it gets to trial and go, this is what's happened. And you can cross-examine by reference to it and you can lead evidence by reference to it. Again, I would always have a site visit. I don't think if you are advising in these kind of claims, you can not have a site visit. When I was taught conveyancing back in the days when I actually had hair and it was dark and curly, um, I was taught that you had a site visit or you visited every house that you conveyed. For the simple reason is that when you go and look at the land, there can be a whole reason why things have happened that are only apparent when you look at the land. And if you go in to battle defending or advancing a claim, having not looked at it, and the first time you see it is either when the court has its site visit or not at all, you are at a serious disadvantage. So the first thing you need to do is get out, have a look, have a rummage around and work out just what the lay of the land is and whether or not there's any real impediments on the ground as to what is said to have happened at any particular time. It gives you a much better understanding of what is supposed to have gone on. The second case, and this is, again, is probably just a bugbear of mine, but if you're pleading, everyone relies, because of the difficulties in the Prescription Act and the common law, no one bothers with the common law, just they forget it for now. Everyone relies on the doctrine of lost modern grant. But the one thing you're supposed to do is plead, actually plead a date that the grant is supposed to have been made either before or after. Because then at least that gives, if you're making a claim, that at least sets a period that everyone knows that you're talking about. So it identifies which 20 years you're at least saying that you've used the land for. You can do it in a number of alternatives. You can say, we've you, you know, a grant made before X date or in the alternative X date, and then fall back on the old, well, or any 20 years that the court finds has actually happened to have been. But at least it gives the people defending it a chance to know what it is that you're actually saying and will save the whole cost of a, a whole raft of part 18s going, well, what's the basis of your claim? What date is it that you say? When's the grant supposed to have been made? And it also, in doing that, it requires you to focus on actually which period you are saying has been the use. So you can plead specifically the use that has been made of each individual 20 year period. And it may be because, you know, time, things, don't, things don't stay the same. The user may have changed and morphed over a period. So you may have to plead different qualities of user over different time periods. But again, it's better to be aware of those and having that requirement in mind requires you to focus on the task in hand to, um, so that the parties all are clear about what it is that's being claimed. And then finally, because uh, I realize I've got about 30 seconds before one o'clock, um, mediation, uh, I, I entirely, concur with what Nigel was saying earlier in that mediation should be made more use of, certainly in property disputes. Property disputes, you know, for those of us that practice in this field, we're well used to the hostility we get from the judicial bench when we stand up and open a property case. They hate, they hate us. They hate neighbour disputes. Uh, they don't like it with a, all the passion in, that they can muster frequently and make it often very plain to all concerned. So therefore, anything that can be done, and also you have to remember that, sorry, also you have to remember that even after the hearing, even after you go to trial and one party wins, one party loses, these people have to live next door to each other unless one put the house on the market and sell. So an early mediation is often beneficial for all the parties. Um, and even if it's only so that you actually properly understand the other side's case, it is always beneficial. Uh, and I think as early as possible, and I agree with what Nigel was saying, that I don't think there's a, the argument, oh, we, we need disclosure, we need experts, we need whatever, always punt it off. It is really valid. Um, you should be able to have a proper discussion about what each party's case ultimately will be um, without needing of lots of documents, because let's face it, there won't be, the whole point of a prescriptive claim is there aren't any documents in the first place. Um, so documentary evidence is gonna be limited.
Um, I am now one minute past, for which I apologise, and I think that's probably a good time to end. Thanks very much for that, Paul. Um, there have been a few questions um, coming and going while you've been on. Um, uh, Nigel has, has dealt with uh, all of them, I think, apart from one, which is from Costas Crustis. I'm sorry if I haven't pronounced that correctly. Um, asking, can you potentially claim rights to park on land over which you only have express written rights of way to pass and repass? to access your neighbouring property. So you've got an express right of way over, over the Serbian land. Can you claim prescriptive rights to park on that? Well, yes, well, there's a, a barrel of worms. Um, easements to park were, of course, really controversial for many years. By and large, it's been settled you can get an easement to park, but you do get into the dreaded area of whether or not the ouster principle applies. So it depends upon the scope of the easement claimed in relation to the land. And as I say, the difficulty, if you already have a, a right, to some extent, a right of way has a number of incidental rights, such as a right to park for limited periods. So it could be used to expand those rights in the right circumstances, I think, is probably the, before I go off on a very long winded yeah, it's one of those things that, that it's it'll be that um, fact and degree thing, won't it? So if if it if it if the parking in question looks very different from the actual from the use of the express right of way, um, then you'd be in with a stronger shout. Um, uh, in answer to the question about the slides, if the slides haven't um, if the link to the slides hasn't appeared in in the chat as yet, um, I think that they're going to be sent out to all um, registered attendees anyway so don't worry about that um, and then I think the last question um, is um, regarding local authority ownerships where the public have access what would be the best way to protect the land by notice by stating um, perhaps by stating that the use is by permission of the local authority I presume if we're talking about public ownership we'd be talking about highways and the um, a public right of way as opposed to a private easement. But again, uh, my understanding is that even having been the ex-solicitor for the um, Ramblers Association, if I delve... Quite a claim to fame. <laughs> if I delve far enough back, then yes, a sign that it is permissive would have the same effect in terms of public rights. Right, there's just... Um... Yes, yeah, some clarification has just been provided. I don't think it change, it'll change what you say. So I think the, the, um, what Linda has in mind is, is playing fields where the public have access. Well, that would, you'd step into village green territory as an area for pastimes, which again is a slightly different beast altogether. But again, as, it, as all the authorities are, are the same, as of right is as of right, within the meaning of the village green legislation. So again, a sign should be sufficient in those that it's permissive use to make it prevent it from being um, as of right. Excellent. Right. Well, thanks for uh, dealing with those, Paul. Um, thank you to everyone for attending. Um, next up on the, um, the pick and mix uh, is an exceptionally um, impressive speaker um, at uh, two o'clock. Um, it's a, a Mr. Geraint Wheatley, I believe, um, who's going to be talking about um, uh, commercial rent arrears. So um, I may see uh, some of you there. Otherwise, thanks for, for coming along today. Cheerio. Bye-bye. Thank you.